I'm Drew Stevenson. This is for my administrative law class. Here we're going to be talking about a doctrine with judicial review of agency actions called the Major Questions Doctrine and how it was applied in a 2023 U.S. Supreme Court case, Biden versus Nebraska, which was about one of Biden's student loan forgiveness programs. So having said that, let's dive in. So our big takeaway here is that the Supreme Court invalidated the student loan forgiveness program based on something called the Major Questions Doctrine, or MQD. What is that? Well, it's basically a, what we call in law and especially statutory interpretation circles, a clear statement rule. In other words, Congress must speak very clearly and explicitly when authorizing an agency to exercise powers of vast economic and political significance. A lot of agency statutes are kind of general, and, and they task the agency with implementing certain policies or entrust the agency uh, with certain parts of federal governance and uh, express it in vague or broad terms. And the question then becomes, how far can the agency go if its action technically fits within the wording or text of the statute? but is sort of a really drastic um, poli sweeping policy change. And that's what the major questions doctrine is really about. If you're hoping that there's a bright line here, there's not. Um, so at least at this point. So a little bit of background without getting into too many of the nitty gritty details about how student loans work. My students are probably more familiar with it than I am. Um, so that, this first comes up in 1958, Congress passed something called the National Defense Education Act that authorized the first federal student loans um, for up to $1,000 a year. Remember that tuition and everything else in 1958 was much cheaper than it is uh, today. Subsequent enactments over the decades um, by Congress expanded the student loan program considerably, uh, kind of subdivided it into three different types and authorized the Secretary of Education to sometimes cancel or waive or reduce debts in special circumstances. And so this grows over time with the national economy and our GDP and the federal deficit, so that by the time we get to 2023, outstanding federal student loans total $1.6 trillion and are owed by 43 million borrowers. Now, the Supreme Court majority takes that as obviously having huge economic significance. Those are really big numbers, but the question is their big number the how big they are compared to things like our gross national product or our gross domestic product and the federal um, budget overall now in 2000 September 2001 as you probably know we had these terrorist attacks on 911 and in response, Congress passed a lot of legislation um, and financial assistance, including something called the HEROES Act, which provided the Secretary of Education with a specific waiver authority to respond to conditions in that national emergency. So let's look at the statute. It gets codified at 20 USC, section 1098BBA1.1, and it authorizes the Secretary of Education to, quote, waive or modify any statutory or regulatory provision applicable to the student financial assistance programs under the Education Act as the Secretary deems necessary in connection with a war or other military operation or national emergency. So I do want to be clear here, whatever you may have heard from political pundits on either side, there was some statutory basis, for, first of all, for the student loan program and for the Secret Secretary of Education to, in certain circumstances to issue waivers or um, uh, debt cancellation and so forth. But the question was how much and how far could they take this? Uh, back to the statute, the Secretary of Education, there are some conditions, may issue waivers or modifications only, quote, as may be necessary to ensure that recipients of student financial assistance under the Act are not placed in a worse position financially. And they can do so only for borrowers who, quote, suffered direct economic hardship as a direct result of, and it lists a few things involving military service or a national emergency as determined by the Secretary. So 
um, we're going to have sort of two stages of presidential action here. And the takeaway I want my students to get is that even though by the time things reach the U.S. Supreme Court, policies have taken on a lot of sort of political symbolic significance and become associated with one party or one president. But the fact is that a lot of our federal policies span multiple administrations from different parties. And so maybe one administration starts a program and then the next administration continues it and maybe extends it or expands it or takes it in a new direction as um, happened here. And so, but it, it's not just pulled out of thin air by one administration. A lot of the, this is very common that policies span multiple administrations and develop over time. So let's start in 2020, um, President Trump declared the COVID-19 pandemic a national emergency in March. This was the same month that a lot of schools uh, closed down and went online and so forth very early when we basically recognized that we were in a pandemic and no one at that point had any idea how long it would last or how many people would perish or um, whether we would develop vaccines and so forth. Now I put the word declared and bold because when the president or in some cases governors um, declare something a state of emergency, there's a lot of legal significance to that. It triggers the um, application of a lot of statutory like, like emergency clauses in a, a variety of statutes and enables uh, different agencies to do different things that are basically exercises of emergency powers. So declaring a state of emergency is a legal speech act that has a lot of significance. A week later, um, the Secretary of Education, who at the time was Betsy DeVos, announced that she was suspending student loan repayments and interest accrual for all federally held student loans. And then the next week, still in 2020, Congress enacted the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, which required the Secretary of Ed, um, Education to extend the suspension of repayment of loans through the end of September 2020. So that was several months in the future, still the same year, but would be well into the beginning of the following school year. Now, let's fast forward two years. We have a new president in the White House from a different party. And in August 2022, a few weeks, and the, I'm quoting the Supreme the Court majority here, um, a few weeks before uh, President Biden stated that the pandemic is over, the Department of Education announced that it was once again issuing waivers and modifications under the act, this time to reduce and eliminate student debts uh, directly. Now, this was something that Biden had, had been a campaign promise. He had campaigned on student debt relief or loan forgiveness and so forth. And so uh, as here we are um, a couple of years into his presidency and he's doing this. Now, I want you to note that the, the court's use of sort of slippery or suggestive language here that they're saying President Biden was about to state that the pandemic is, is over. That's different than the previous president declaring a state of emergency, right? So holding a press conference and saying sort of wishfully, I think things are over or the worst is over or something like that does not have the same legal significance as declaring a state of emergency. Um, but the way the court uh, frames this is to sort of set the stage for what it's holding is going to be. And here's a little bit about how it worked for borrowers with an adjusted gross income below 125,000 a year in either 2020 or 2021 who have eligible um, federal loans, the Department of Education will discharge the balance of those loans in an amount of uh, up to $10,000 per borrower. And then Pell Grants qualified for up to $20,000 in loan cancellation. Um, the Supreme Court, here's a couple of quotes from the majority opinion. The secretary's past actions under the act were much narrower and did not involve mass debt uh, cancellations. That's true. Um, the prior um, uses of or invocations of the waiver power or um, debt canceling power under the act had been um, much more specific and narrowly tailored. And the cancellation plan had a significant economic impact. And the court quotes one source that it likes here. 
to estimate the cost between 430 billion and 519 billion. I'm gonna come back to that later. So this economic magnitude raised concerns about the balance of power between the legislative and executive branches. And um, now the dissent here says that the um, court is basically just has this newfangled major questions doctrine that they can use to nullify policies that they don't like and meddle in the executive branch activities. And that kind of puts the majority uh, um, on the defensive. And so they explain that there have actually been a lot of major questions doctrine cases from all corners of the administrative state. And I'm highlighting that for my students so that you understand that in recent years, this has become a big deal in administrative law and is now something that everybody who studies administrative law needs to know about and um, understand. In other words, the Supreme Court and appellate courts are using the major questions doctrine a lot more recently. Here's a quote from the holding. In our precedent, old and new requires that Congress speak clearly before a department secretary can unilaterally alter large sections of the American economy. We expect Congress to speak clearly when authorizing an agency to exercise powers of vast economic and political significance. That's a nice quote articulating the major questions doctrine, the gist of the major questions doctrine, at least as it stood in 2023. I pulled out another um, quote to kind of highlight from the opinion. All this leads us to conclude that the basic and consequential trade-offs inherent in a mass, mass debt cancellation program are ones that Congress would likely have intended for itself. And I put that, I put that in bold that they're suggesting that Congress probably, they don't believe that Congress would have wanted the president or the secretary of education to do something so sweeping and dr drastic. And, um, and if they did, in such circumstances, we have required the secretary to point to clear congressional authorization to justify the challenged program. And I've cleaned this up and taken out some of the internal citations and quotations. Now, where does this leave us? Uh, when we talk about this case and reflect on what happened here, I want you to notice that the court, the majority, focuses on the economic cost of this program solely in terms of the amounts to be canceled. Uh, you should be aware that there were many economists who thought that it was more complicated than that, that this would be offset by the increase in the spending power of college and um, grad school graduates whose extra money would have been pumped back into the economy, right? So if people didn't have to repay their stu these huge student loans, they would be able to maybe buy a starter home or buy a new car or um pay rent, up, upgrade their living situation or things like that. So they would, they were, they were going to spend that money. The money would continue to circulate in the economy. Graduates aren't going to just stuff uh, money into their mattresses uh, when um, we canceled their student loans. And the result of the money being spent is it still comes back to the federal government in higher corporate tax revenues. And um, and so some economists actually thought that the program would be a net positive in the long run for the federal uh, budget, even though in the short run you're canceling debt, those borrowers now have a lot more economic power and economic freedom and job mobility and things like that. And so it could actually uh, really stimulate and help the economy. And then that in turn should, um, raises tax revenues. That, that was the argument. And I'm probably not going to convince you one way or another in this short video, but you should be aware that there are pretty sophisticated economic arguments on both sides about this. You should also be aware that President Biden tried this again um, simply by another legal route instead of um, having the Secretary of Education do it under the emergency power clause in the statute. And then let's uh, kind of wrap up this video by talking just for a moment about the major questions doctrine, because that's the whole reason I made this video. I, uh, we're talking about this case is to talk about this doctrine. And um, there are some problems or criticisms of the major questions doctrine. And it, I hope you understand the, the appeal of this, right? That we could have a kind of a vague phase or a phrase or a passing phrase in a statute that an agency is like reading way too much into. And some of the other major questions cases, um, the phrase that they'll use is um, 
elephants in a mouse hole, right? That they're finding reading way too much into a passing phrase in a statute and trying to do something that nobody previously thought that the agency could do. The problem on the other side is that this doctrine is very much in the eye of the beholder. And the question is, is it too subjective? There is no bright line rule yet, at least from the court, about how major is too major. And so we don't know when a case starts to go to the Supreme Court or work its way up on appeal, whether what the agency's doing is going to seem like too big and too consequential for the judge. And the fact is that most of these cases, almost all of them that we've had at the time I'm making this video, have split along party lines. So it seems like judges are maybe just using the major questions doctrine as a proxy to block executive branch policies that they dislike for political reasons. So if it's not their party in the White House, they think everything they're doing is an overreach. And when it is a policy that they like from a president that they like, then they think it's fine. And again, we don't have the, it's not an objective test. Um, and also keep in mind that despite the court's rhetoric, that it's sort of all up to them to protect the separation of powers and, um, and guard against executive branch overreach. The fact is if Congress disapproves of an agency action, it can quickly nullify it under the Congressional Review Act, as long as they can get a streamlined resolution through both houses and get it signed by the president. And they do that a lot, right? They've, they've done that um, many times in the last few Congresses where they have negated an agency, a specific agency action they didn't like. So if Congress didn't like this, they could call a vote in the House and in the Senate and, um, and basically say, you can't do that to the agency. So if Congress has the power to police this, why do the courts have to meddle in it or um, put themselves in the position of doing so? And that concludes our um, lecture about Biden versus Nebraska and the major questions doctrine.